Welcome to First Friday. It's January 2nd, 2015. I hope you all had a nice new year. Tonight, we lead off with Lindsay Baker, who shows her friends off in a document she calls Selfie Culture at the Art Mission Theater. We stopped into Burger Ski. We went to the YMCA, where we learned about a free admission on First Fridays. It was the fourth annual Bob Johnston photo contest, and we spoke with the daughter of Bob Johnston. And we listened to the exquisite saxophone and bass of Rob Weinberg at River Raid Books. And finally, we stopped in the Bundy Museum to see the photography series Welcome back to called Rituals Foundation. by Olivia C. Tony. And to wrap it up, we listened to the amazing jams of the Mosaic Foundation from the Cyber Cafe. is very good for the brain okay and last was it last year or no more than two years ago there was an article in the Ithaca Journal we're at the art mission and theater with Lindsay Baker <laughs> and this is an expose on selfie culture um, but a lot of the inspiration that you had came from working at a job where you were framing pictures. Yeah, yeah, I was a custom framer for a little while and uh, the woman I worked with was incredibly knowledgeable about her job and she had like, you know, a litany of information and she really opened my eyes to how frames can complement artwork and everything. I never thought of it that way and I really became attracted to um, really old, like disgusting, gaudy frames. I think they're beautiful. So it started off with me finding a bunch of, you know, random junk objects I had around and kind of compiling them together into um, sort of like a, a contemporary, like gaudy, baroque frame. And then I started putting my friends' portraits into them because I see I mean, I hate to talk about selfie culture. I think it's kind of ridiculous, but because people have been taking self portraits for years. Yeah, but, um, but we used to seeing them in a little framed panel in the social network. Right, right, right. And I just kind of wanted to embellish upon that because I think in an age where people have their image violated constantly, um, I think it's great to actually embellish that. And you know, like, these are my friends, and I like seeing them on my newsfeed. I don't mind it. Like, you know, snap away. Yeah. My f first impression of these is that. Um, they're not two-dimensional because of the ability to frame them so poignantly. Um, they're very colorful and they're certainly reaching into the space of the room mm -hmm. with these frames. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to do something like that and I wanted them to be almost be like comic book panels too at the same time. I can definitely sense part of that mm -hmm. and a lot of the paintings that you do. Um, and it's kind of strange because the way that you paint it, it depicts a token of familiarity and friendship, but these are pictures that people take of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it's like friendliness with yourself. What's going on in selfie culture? Um, it's, it's more so just me being friendly with my friends. You know, other people might just, you know, go right past it and disregard it or be like, oh, why is that person taking so many pictures of themselves? But I'm like, you know, I, I kind of welcome that. And I'm like, these people are special to me, so I'm going to embellish them in the best way possible. Which to me is just, you know, it might seem kind of goofy, but I'm like, oh, I'll make your picture because, you know, I want to spend some time, like, you know, working on this. Yeah. yeah. I'm here outside the YMCA because it's First Friday. What does that mean? Free admission. You're big into the YMCA when you come here to see all of 
because this show is our fourth annual show. It's the Bob Johnson Photography Contest. And we have submissions from various great photographers from many areas. Um, and you might want to talk to Peg Johnson since she does this show in honor of her father, who is also a gallery member. His work's right behind me. And um, she can tell you all about his work. She has had that long interest in meteorology and weather and clouds and and Peg, what was your inspiration for the show? Well clearly my father was the inspiration and I think the gallery voted initially, even without my having to say a word, uh, to do something to memorialize him and his art. He was a member of the gallery for many, many years from the beginning in two thousand and he uh, you know, had many shows, but also was a real cooperative member where he worked hard to renovate the space and help staff it and so forth. So we got the idea to, to sponsor this uh, competition as a way to honor photography and focus on photography and um, and sort of honor his his memory. The um, this is the fourth. Um, iteration of this show and this competition. Would and you like to tell us how many entries we have? Well, this is, this is quite a record. We have 90 different photographs here and 40 different photographers. And this year and the last couple of years, we have um, partnered with the Two Rivers Photography Club. And they, um, they, they have contributed a lot of uh, participation and a lot of energy to this to this show.
So again, one of our campaigns for this year in 2016 is to try to work with realtors to get information about the history of a home in their hands in an effort to sell those properties more specifically to people who are interested in that history. Families consider these homes, people that have the ability to manage these homes acquire them and keep them up. These pieces that they're pulling out of these houses are handcrafted for the most part, depending upon their age. But yeah, they're here, but we've got a location where we sell. It's open the first and third Saturdays of the month. Yeah, it's true Parler, form. Parler City in its true form, yeah. So that's one of the goals that we have. Uh, now back to your comment about the old Victorian houses. Before they're torn down, we attempt to get in them and salvage any chandeliers, whatever we can get our hands on. It's a matter of legacy, it's a matter of maintaining those properties. January was an exciting time to be alive in Binghamton. We went to Art Walk on first Friday to see a lot of exciting galleries. We also stopped into Burger Ski and Supply Gear Shop that are getting people ready to go ski down the mountain. They are um, uh, very traditional 1600 style Dutch influenced still life pieces. So they're influenced by, you know, uh, Dutch masters paintings. And so um, it's not as though they necessarily depict rituals themselves, but it's in the setting up of the photos that is the ritual. And it's about mortality, it's about transience. But um, I mean, I don't. I don't intend to burn it all the way down. I wouldn't, you know. The I intend to keep the image intact. I work here, and so like I am often like writing stuff or editing photos or, you know, planning stuff out. So, uh, Bundy Museum at Gmail dot com. Okay, that's very simple. Yep, totally. And we have a website, uh, BundyMuseum dot org. Like there's stuff that I've heard, like there's my taste and the director's taste and, you know, if we did nothing but our, you know, if we did only artists that suited our own taste, everything would look the same and I would prefer that, but we do try and get like a really eclectic mix to appeal to everybody because it is, it's a museum in the public sphere, so, you know, we have to appeal to our wide audience of, uh, members and visitors. Uh, I did that one too. <laughs> so, it's an exciting, it's a very quick process. It's, um, compared to that, to regular high fire, it's very immediate because in an hour and a half you know what you have. Either it's a hit or a miss. Most of the time they're hits because I've been doing it for a long time. And are these artworks, or how much of a use do people get from them when they try to eat from them? Okay, you cannot eat and drink out of raccoon. It's purely decorative. The high fire, the electric stuff, the bowls and the mugs and the plates are all things you can use. You can put them in your microwave, you can put them in the dishwasher. But raccoon is strictly decorative. You can put flowers in it, that's it. How did you come with the relationship with Orazio Salati? Um, I used to show at a gallery called Handwork in Ithaca. And he came in one day and saw some of the things that I did and said, you live in Binghamton? How come you're not showing anywhere in Binghamton? And I said, well, I've never really seen a gallery that I thought would work. And he said, would you consider mine? And I said, I have to come and see it first. I was really playing, it was sort of hard to get, but I really felt that it had to be the right kind of setting for it. So he was on the second floor then, so I came one day and I said, okay, because it was a beautiful gallery. And he's always shown my work in absolutely the most fabulous lighting and 
you know, displayed exactly the right way. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my connection. So, so this, this show is, is just the two of us, which is really cool because his paintings and my work, you know, go together beautifully. Yeah, they're, they're both so vivid. Yeah. And more, they enhance each other, which is really wonderful. And he is a wonderful guy to work with. He's probably one of the best gallery owners I've ever worked with. Yeah, I think everything is always so well spaced out when I come in here. Yeah, no, and, and, and he takes good care of everything. You know, when you put your work here, that it's going to be treasured and it's going to be shown the right way. And it's not going to, you know, you're not going to take it home broken, which uh, can happen in galleries too. So when did you decide to get your own furnace? My own kiln. When I moved, I moved here from from Evanston, Illinois, near outside Chicago, um, 14 years ago. And first, I tried working elsewhere, and then I decided I needed to have the studio in my home. So, probably about 12 years ago. I used to work in a cooperative studio in Chicago with 12 other patterns, but that doesn't really exist here. What were those days like working with 12 other people in one studio? It was wonderful because it was a large studio. We each rented space and we shared kilns so that you didn't have to invest in all that equipment by yourself. So there were many pieces loaded into the kiln each firing. Uh, no, actually people would rent the whole kiln just for themselves or sometimes they'd share it. These were big gas kilns, high fire kilns for functional work. The Raku kiln, I, I actually never had one of my own. I used one at this, I used to teach at the Evanston Art Center and I used the Raku kiln there. So that's what I used for my own work for years. And when I moved here, I didn't have that. So that's when I bought it, a Raku kiln as well as an electric kiln. Besides any dangers of burning, is there any types of health risks of working with the kiln? There's a health risk with clay dust, with glazes. I wear masks. I wear gloves when I have to. I try to be very, very careful because none of it is terribly good for you, and you really have to know what to do. Years ago, um, at the art center where I was teaching, we had someone come in who was a health expert who had to, who did a whole study of hazardous materials in the studio and how to handle everything. And I've pretty much been following her directly ever since. I would not want to take a chance. That's why I wear a big mask when I do it. When I mix up glazes, I wear a mask. I have a, a um, spray booth with a, a very strong fan that exhausts everything. I have an exhaust fan out of my kiln so that we don't breathe any of that stuff. Check it out. See if you like it. Maybe you will be interested in their daycare programs. Maybe you can obtain a $50 discount for a gym membership on the other days of the month. Well, I hope you consider visiting the YMCA to start off your first Friday tour at the Big Town. Then you're an optimist. Only a pessimist would say bad I'm over his head.
Hey,